Let me give you a single statistic that I think captures the difference in a pretty dramatic way. If you looked at the Fortune 500 companies in the 1970s, and you asked the question, where is the value coming from in these companies? And you looked at their balance sheets to determine where the value was. More than 80% of the value on the balance sheets of Fortune 500 companies was in physical stuff. So if you had the stuff, you could create value. If you do the same exercise today, look at the balance sheets of Fortune 500 companies, say, where's the value coming from? More than 85% of the value comes from what are called intangibles. It can be intellectual property, it can be the brand connection with the consumer. But the point is that those are all things that are much less tied to physical stuff and much more tied to people. Everyone's talking about the metaverse these days, but Workplace from Meta is different. I mean, the clue's in the name, right? Workplace is a business communication tool that uses features like instant messaging and video calls to help people share information. Think Facebook, but for your company. It's part of Meta's vision for the future of work, a future in which your job isn't just something you do, but something you experience. And if you've been listening to this show, you know that experience is something that I am very passionate about and talk about a lot. Workplace from Meta is creating a future in which we'll all feel more present, connected, and productive. You can learn more and start your journey into the future of work at workplace.com forward slash future. Again, that's workplace.com forward slash future. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Leading the Future of Work. My guest today is Alan Murray, CEO of Fortune Media, also the author of a brand new book called Tomorrow's Capitalist, My Search for the Soul of Business. Alan, thank you for joining me. Great to be with you, Jacob. Thanks for having me. Of course, of course. Um, why don't we start with a little bit of background information about you. So how did you grow up? Uh, where were you raised? How did you get involved with journalism and ultimately becoming the CEO of Fortune Media? Uh, well, I've, uh, I've been a journalist literally my entire life. I started when I, was, uh, when I was nine years old. For some reason, I had this compulsion to walk up and down the street and ask people about their missing pets or their visiting grandmother, or, and I would take notes. And my, my, I have here on my desk, I'll show it to you if you want, and the old typewriter my mother used to type it up using wow. special carbon paper. This is, I'm, I'm, I'm aging myself here, Jacob, but this is before the days of Kinko's and easy access to Xerox machines. So I had a jelly sheet mimeograph machine that I could, where I could run it off and print 30 copies and I sold them for wow. a nickel. So I've been doing this before I was old enough to think about it, which from time to time kind of disturbed me. I would have liked to have made a choice, but I've, I've been a journalist pretty much my entire life. Wow, that's crazy. And how did you get to become the CEO of Fortune Media? So you transitioned uh, you know, from journalist, from purely creating the content and doing the stories, to now actually running you know, this, this global media empire. Yeah, well, well, look, I mean, going back to when I was nine years old, I was a journalist, but I was also an entrepreneur. I was creating a little business then. And really, most of my career has been a, a cross of at least uh, management and journalism. I mean, I ran my high school newspaper. I ran my college newspaper. Uh, I helped the the Chattanooga Times, my hometown newspaper, mm. create their first business section. Uh, uh, worked for the Wall Street Journal for a long time. Did a lot of kind of entrepreneurial stuff for them. So it's not as big a leap as it might seem. Uh, it happened. Fortune, you probably know, was one of 24 magazines owned by Time Inc. Time Inc. five years ago sold to a company called Meredith, which then turned around and sold off four of its best known titles, uh, Fortune, Time, Sports Illustrated, and Money. And the buyer of Fortune asked me to come on as CEO. Hmm. I, I love the history of the company because probably few people know, but what, didn't the company start almost 100 years ago? That's right. That's right. Yeah, very good. Yeah. It was Henry Luce. Yep. He created Time Magazine uh, about 100 years ago, uh, early 1920s. 
And then uh, as the 20s roared on, you know, it was a great er era for business. Uh, he went to his board of directors in 1929 and said, I think we should create a business magazine. And he took him a, a prototype. Now, this was September of 1929, which was right, you know, in the midst of the boom. The magazine didn't actually launch until February of 1930, which was at the beginning of the bust and the Great Depression. Uh, so our, our early years were covering the pain of the Great right. Depression. Uh, but yeah, that's that's the the history of the of the publication. It's interesting because I know a lot of people oftentimes use Fortune Media as a case study because they say, oh, you know, you can launch businesses in tough times. There's opportunity in tough times, and people frequently say, right. like, look at Fortune Media. They they really launched during the Great Depression, and you know, look at what happened to them. You could do it too. That's right. And the other thing I'd say about that history, Jacob, that I think it's significant. It really gave us from the very beginning something of a social conscience. Um, and we have in the last quarter century worked in various ways to develop that. Our most powerful women in business list is about 25 years old. And, and I, I think a number of the people who are in senior leadership positions, a number of the women who are in senior leadership positions will say that we played a role mm -hmm. in getting them there. Uh, we have another list called 100 Best Companies to Work For yeah. that we do in conjunction with the Great Place to Work Institute. And I think that's also 25 years old and I think has played a role in raising the level of the way companies treat their employees. Yeah. Uh, and then in the last five or six years, uh, we've, we've doubled down yet again. We created something called the Change the World list which focuses on companies that are explicitly trying to address social problems as part of their profit-making strategy. Hmm. Um, and we created a community called the CEO Initiative that is a couple hundred CEOs who, are, who uh, meet regularly to share best practices on how to improve their social impact at the same time they're building profitable yeah. businesses. So I do have some uh, more serious questions for you, but before we jump into those, the and you guys are famous for the cover, the cover of Fortune magazine. Every business leader wants to be on the cover. So I have to ask you, how do you get on the cover of Fortune magazine? What's what's the requirement? What do you guys look for? Well, here's here's the most recent issue, Sam Bankman Freed. So. One way you get on the cover is to create a business that makes billions and billions of dollars, as he has done in, in uh, crypto. Um, uh, but there are other examples. I'm just uh, uh, flipping, flipping through here. Uh, this is uh, Sarah uh, Blankley, the founder of Spanx, which again, you know, turned into a multi-billion dollar business. So I guess I would say the best way to do it is to create a very successful business. <laughs> create a very successful business, then you can email Alan and see if you can get on the list. Yeah, say I would like to be on your cover. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, so shifting to something a little, a little more serious. I mean, you've been in this space for uh, a long time. You've interviewed a lot of leaders over the years. How, how do you think, maybe we could start with business and then we'll shift over to leadership. But when you look at how business yeah. itself has changed, over the last 10, 15, even 20 years, what was business primarily about when you first started and what is the big shift that you're seeing as far as business in 2022, 2023 and beyond? Yeah, it's, it's really dramatic, uh, uh, Jacob. But uh, uh, look, I've been watching business and particularly the intersection between business and society for four decades now. Yeah. So different today than it was when I started four decades ago. Um, so. How is it different? Uh, I, I, I mean, that's the point of the book, and I could go on forever about that. But let me give you a single statistic that I think captures the difference in a pretty dramatic way. If you looked at the Fortune 500 companies in the 1970s, and you asked the question, where is the value coming from in these companies? And you looked at their balance sheets to determine where the value was. More than 80% of the value on the balance sheets of Fortune 500 companies was in physical stuff. Mm -hmm. It was plants, it was equipment, it was oil in the ground, inventory on the shelf. So if you had the stuff, yeah. you could create 
value. And, and that's why we developed a system that depended so heavily on returns to the providers of capital, because you needed capital to accumulate the stuff, and then the stuff gave you the value. If you do the same exercise today, look at the balance sheets of Fortune 500 companies, say, where's the value coming from? More than 85% of the value comes from what are called intangibles. Yep. It can be intellectual property. It can be the brand connection with the consumer. But the point is that those are all things that are much less tied to physical stuff and much more tied to people. Uh, to the people, either your employees who can walk out the, you know, walk in and out the door every day, or to your special relationship with your customers. And so, over the course of that fifty years, business has necessarily become much more human mm. because people are where the value is. Yeah, it's interesting. Speaking of people, um, so I, I interview a lot of CEOs and, and authors such as yourself, uh, and, and just really interesting people on, on the show, and I've. I kind of noticed two camps, and I'm curious which one uh, you might fall into. So it, it seems to me, at least, that there's a little bit of a misbalance in the world as far as organizations and, and talent. Um, you know, it used to be uh, 5, 10, 20 years ago that a lot of the organizations had the power, and they, and they dictated the pay, the benefits, when you work, all that sort of stuff. And now the pendulum has shifted into the hands of employees but from what I'm hearing from a lot of executives is that some people believe it shifted too much. And that, uh, you know, when I talk to a lot of CEOs, they say, look, we're hiring people. And sometimes the people that we're hiring, they want a ridiculous amount of equity in the company. They want to make more money than even their boss's boss makes. And on top of that, they never even want to come into work. And <laughs> right, the perspective is kind of like, it's gotten so out of whack, so out of balance. I mean, can you even imagine a time like 10, 15 years ago when somebody said, hey, you know, I, I'd love to work at Fortune Media. And he's like, great, great, you can have the job. Oh, by the way, I never want to come in. Like, I, you know, I- Yeah, I, yeah, no, I, look, there, there are important, they're very important. I, I, I love your question. And I see both sides of it. Uh, uh, you know, is it good, is it bad? I, I mean, there, there's good stuff and there's bad stuff. Um, uh, but there's no question that it's it's different. I mean, I spent two years between the Wall Street Journal and starting at Fortune. I spent two years running the Pew Research Center, and we did a lot of research on the millennial generation. And yeah. one of the things you realize when you look at that research is this is a group of people who are much slower to get married, much less likely to belong to an organized church, not big joiners generally, so they don't belong to the Rotary Club or the Moose Club. And you realize that the employer is their most significant formal connection, in many cases, their only formal connection to society. So all their hopes and dreams and expectations and desire to do good get channeled towards that employer. And, and uh, that has some good effects and some bad effects. Good effects, I mean, for the last decade, I kept have I, I'm fortunate in my position to spend a lot of time to uh, talking to CEOs who run large organizations. Uh, I mean, hundreds of them over the course of ten years, and I noticed that they were talking very differently about their responsibility to society, about their feelings about towards the environment, rising inequality, all of these issues that used to be thought of as government issues, not business issues. So I always said to them, why are you doing this? Why are you talking about this? Why is this a focus? Every time the first answer was, and there are multiple reasons, but number one was my employees want me to. So companies are, fe are definitely feeling that pressure. And I think in a good way, it's making yeah. them better. You know, there are certainly moments of frustration for every CEO, including me, where what where employees seem to be I'll give you an example. Let me give you a fun example from my own experience. We've been very flexible about return to office at Fortune. So, you know, we 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 do free lunch on Wednesdays. A lot of people come in the rest of the week. There aren't a lot of people in the office. And uh in May, when we were heading towards summer, I got a couple of notes from people on the staff who said, are we going to do summer Fridays this year? I said, what are you talking about? None of you have been in the office on a Friday in two years. Why would we do summer Fridays? So there is a sense of 
uh, entitlement that I think for people in leadership positions can all sometimes sort of knock them back. But yep. for the most part, I guess I would say the new generation has had an extremely positive impact on the direction of business. Yeah. And, and so, sorry, you cut out there for a couple of seconds when you were talking about some of the topics that a lot of CEOs are talking about now. It sounds like you said one of them was diversity and inclusion. What were some of the other ones that you keep hearing about? I think the three big ones uh, that we've found in our conversations, one is uh, uh, inequality and opportunity. Okay. Uh, that, you know, the the... JFK notion that a rising tide lifts all boats seems to have been challenged in recent years. We've had a rising tide. It has not lifted all boats. And so I think a lot of CEOs feel, a lot of the best CEOs feel responsible for like, what can we do to restart that escalator of opportunity yeah. uh, to make sure that more people have the opportunity to access the good jobs that we're creating? So that's one. Two, certainly diversity, equity, and inclusion, which was on most CEOs' radar screen before the George Floyd uh, killing, but certainly jumped up dramatically yeah. uh, in the months afterwards. It's it's a big issue for a lot of leaders. And then the third is climate. You, you know, if you, again, look at the Fortune 500 companies, there's been close to a 300% increase in wow. the number of Fortune 500 companies that have made some sort of net zero commitment in the last three years. And it's now a majority of Fortune 500 companies have made wow. some sort of net zero commitment. Now, you can have an argument about how many of those are sufficient or even real, or are they just public relations? But, but it, it's a big change, and yeah. a lot of them clearly are real. Yeah, no, it's, I, mean, I mean, that's great to hear as well. Um, so, so it sounds like you're optimistic and positive because, you know, that's kind of the one camp that I hear from CEOs is that, you know, employees are kind of taking advantage. And the other side I hear is, well, you guys deserve it. You know, you, these are the types of organizations you created for years. You didn't treat employees well. You didn't change your workplace practices. You had leaders who were berating their people and, you know, in front of their teams. And yeah, now employees have the power and, and you know, now it's their time. Um, so it's, it's kind of like this really interesting balance that's happening, but at least from what I'm seeing and hearing, it seems like it almost swung too much in the hands of employees and it needs to get balanced a little bit. I think even, uh, the example I've used on this show a lot is, uh, you know, the CEO of Amazon, he raised the minimum wage and now people were saying, Hey, can you raise it? I think it was at 17 or 18 and they're saying raise it to 25 and 28. And he had to push back and say, at a certain point, this doesn't become a scalable and realistic thing for business. Like, we, it's just, you can do so much, but at a certain point, we, we just don't have right. the resources to give you that much equity or to give you that big of a salary. Right. So do but, you think there's but, misbalance? Uh, um, no. I, I really firmly believe there is more good than bad. Look, it depends a lot on the company. Yeah. I, Amazon is not at the top of my list of companies <laughs> that have traditionally treated its, treated their employees well. I yep. think there's a feeling from people who know the company well that they've uh, they've put a, a premium on technology over a premium on people. Interestingly, their their biggest competitor, you might argue, Walmart, has surprisingly done the opposite, much more focused on building a, a, a strong people culture. Um, uh, so, but, th but I mean, to your point, I mean, there are clearly examples where employees overreach. Some of this return to office stuff, I never want to come back to the office again. Uh, I think there's been a lot of done harm done by employees of tech companies saying, we don't want you to work with the U.S. government. I said, mm. are you kidding me? I mean, every Chinese company is required by charter to work with the Chinese government and you're going to deny uh, leading edge technologies to the U.S. government? What kind of a world are you creating by doing that? So plenty of examples of overreach. Yeah. But, but my sense is, on the whole, there's been more good than bad out of the employee activism. It's funny that you mentioned the government. So my wife is a speaker as well, but she focuses on customer experience and she was giving a talk for a large company. And one of the things that she wanted to share, it was a story about the, uh, the military, you know, it was, it was a pretty good story. 
and the company said, we don't want you to have the military story. We, w- we don't want you to talk about the military in this presentation. And, uh, you know, my wife and I were both very, very surprised by that as well. It's like, you know, I, it's, it's, it's just interesting to see kind of the, the, the changes that we're starting to see. Um, so I, I agree with you. I mean, I, I think there's been a lot of positive change. You know, one of the other big questions that a lot of people keep asking are, do people even want to work anymore? Uh, you know, I think there was, <laughs> right, we keep hearing about quiet quitting. We hear about the great resignation. I think there was a report that came out, uh, what was it, a couple of days ago that said how much of COVID relief, uh, how many billions, like 40 billion of it was fraud. Um, we keep hearing stories of people getting ghosted. You know, I myself tried to hire somebody fairly recently. She went through training and then just disappeared, completely ghosted me. And so at least a lot of the CEOs that I'm talking to are even questioning that. Like, do people even want to work anymore? You know, they don't want to come into the office. Um, are they having side business? I mean, what, what do you think about all this? Do people still want, want to I work? Just think- I think it's a little bit overblown. Uh, look, there are obviously people, there have always been and still are people who don't particularly want to work, don't like their work and would like to do as little of it as possible. Yep. And the other interesting thing that happened during the pandemic was people who had a side gig. Yeah. said, well, I'll, I'll, do, I'll do the minimum I have to do at my main job, but then I'm creating this little business on the side, yeah. you know, that I'm running through Etsy or something. Yep. There's a fair amount of that. So I, I you know, and, and it's not surprising that that drives CEOs up a wall. But geez, uh, the companies that I, the great companies that I talk to on a regular basis, I don't have that problem at Fortune. People are working very hard. Uh, companies like Accenture and Salesforce and Workday and, uh, uh, you know, all have armies of people who are working very hard. I still think there, there are plenty of people who are willing to work hard. I mean, what ha- look, what happened was uh, going to work became dangerous, yeah. even existential. And so there was a group of people who said, who went home and discovered they had big responsibilities caring for their children or their parents or someone and decided, I'm not going to go back. And so you do have a, a large group of Americans who have withdrawn from the labor force. But yep. um, that that's not a huge surprise given the, uh, given the shock of the pandemic. Workplace is a business communication tool from Meta. Think Facebook, but for your company. It's part of Meta's vision for the future of work. A future in which we'll all feel more present, connected, and productive. Start your journey into the future of work at workplace.com forward slash future. Again, that's workplace.com forward slash future. So we talked a little bit about uh, business. Now I want to talk a little bit about leadership, specifically leaders. Uh, So it's interesting. So I have a new book I'm working on exploring leadership and vulnerability, which will come out uh, uh, in a year from now. Great topic. Yeah, it's a great topic. I mean, I can't imagine having to write or even talk to to CEOs. I I don't think anybody would have been willing to speak with me about this five, 10 years ago. Uh, So I think it's been a big change. Uh, but you've obviously talked to and interviewed a lot of leaders. How are you seeing leaders specifically as individuals changing? Yeah, it's, it, it's a very big change. And look, let me put it, let me again put it in some historical perspective. The, the big companies of the 20th century were kind of information hierarchies. Yep. You had all these people out in the field collecting information. They would send it up the chain until it got to the C-suite. And then the people in the C-suite would sit down and formulate a strategy And then they would give everyone orders and the orders would go back down the chain. No company works like that today. (laughs) I mean, first of all, information doesn't travel unidirectionally. It travels omnidirectionally. Second, the world is just changing too fast for you to sit around and wait for somebody up in the C-suite to tell you what to do. Strategies, you know, five-year strategies that used to be commonplace have become Many of them have been tanked because you can't see five years into the future and know what's coming. And so business has become much more about empowering people at the edge. And that changes the job of the leader very dramatically because it becomes much less about telling people what to do and much more about inspiring them, motivating them. And so when you get to the question of vulnerability, that means... Your job as CEO of one of these large companies 
is not to convince people you have all the answers because you don't. And if you try and convince, convince them you have all the answers, you'll end up failing. It's Instead, it's to create the glue, the engagement, the reason, the motivation, and sometimes vulnerability helps. I'll tell you my favorite example. This is probably already on your radar screen, given the research you're doing, but um, uh, the late Arnie Sorensen. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. CEO of Marriott. You know, when the pandemic first hit and what happened to Marriott's business, I mean, they dropped by 99%. I mean, it just dried up. And he had no choice but to furlough uh, uh, many, even most of his employees. And he taped a, a two-minute yep. uh, Twitter um, message that is extraordinary in the annals of business history, I think. Uh, I mean, part of what makes it extraordinary is that he was dying from cancer at the time, and it was showing. But he was also very moved by what he was going to have to do in order to to weather the pandemic. Um, uh, and I mean, I watched that I watched that thing, and he did it on Twitter, so everybody could see it. I watched that thing and was in tears. I wanted to go work for him. <laughs> yeah, know? it was a, 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 and it was an amazing example of authenticity and vulnerability helping you lead through a crisis in today's world. Yeah, I remember that. It's one of the examples I love to share too. It was a, it was a great video. And you're right. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people didn't even realize that he was going through cancer treatment and he was, you know, um, I think last last few months of, of life and, and yeah. still yeah. still did that. It, it was a fantastic example. Um, so it seems like there are some great leaders out there, but why do you think... So one of the things that puzzles me is that we've talked about the changing nature of leadership for years. We've written leadership books for years. You would think that by now collectively the business world would be filled with amazing leaders who put people <laughs> first who care about them who do the right thing who are vulnerable who are empathetic yet most employees around the world if you look at all the engagement numbers out there still say that they're not engaged in their jobs they don't trust their leaders they're unhappy you know the list goes on and on and on why is this um th this issue why are we having such a hard time with this well first of all i don't think it's been uh that long that we've understood this changed nature of leadership. I don't think it's been really uh, built into the curriculum of business schools, for example, yeah. in, as, in as powerful a way as it could. I mean, it's starting to, yeah. but, uh, but I don't think it has been for a long time. Uh, second, it's, this is hard. This is not easy to do. I mean, there's something very, uh, 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 simple and clarifying about the Milton Friedman view of business that your social responsibility is to make a profit, period. It sort of boils it all down to a, a, a financial equation where you look at your return to shareholders and if it's heading in the right direction, you're fine. Yeah. Life is much more complicated when you realize your job isn't just about getting that right. It's about engaging with your employees and engaging with your customers and engaging with their communities in a way that inspires them. You, it's just a bigger, more complicated uh, job. And, and, and I think just to put it in a little bit bigger context, you know, we spent most of the 20th century trying to teach people to act like machines. I mean, that's what scientific management was about. We're going to have a giant production line and you're a cog in the production line. So you're just part of this big machine that's spilling out cars. Um, and, and what's becoming clear in the 21st century is that we need people to be better people. Yep. It's human skills. Yep. And we just haven't, our education systems and our training systems haven't quite made that turn yet. Yeah, it, 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 it's it's the human skills. I mean, I, I, I studied literature as an undergraduate. I think everybody should study literature. If you studied engineering, that, that that's an important set of skills, but that's not going to help you with the inspirational challenge that you and I are talking about. Yep. No, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, one of the other really interesting things, and I don't know if you've been hearing this from a lot of the interviews that you've been doing. It seems like now is probably the hardest time to be a leader. You know, granted, leaders, I think, have more impact now than they ever did before, but it's also really hard. And one of the big challenges I think a lot of leaders are faced with uh, from what they are sharing with me is that on the one hand, we want them to be transparent and open. 
What do you stand for? What do you care about? What social causes do you believe in? How are you going to fight for them? But on the flip side, if you say the wrong thing, people are very quick to come after you. And they're very quick to try to tear you down. And they're very quick to, uh, you know, not give you a break and understand that you're a human being. So how do you think leaders need to balance that, right? I mean, on the one hand, we want vulnerability, we want that transparency, we want that authenticity, but on the flip side, there is this expectation that you're never gonna screw up, that you're never gonna say the wrong thing, um, and that you might have an opinion or a belief or a value that disagrees with mine. And you know, we, we don't seem to have as much of that acceptance anymore. Are you seeing that at all from the conversations yeah. you're having? Yeah, but, but and, and, and look, I mean, first of all, it is hard. It's much harder. Yeah. And second, you are gonna screw up. I mean, just take that for granted. I mean, you live in a social media fishbowl. Uh, you know, the great, the one of the great examples of recent years was when those security guards came on that United Airlines flight yeah. and pulled off Dr. David Dow, and somebody captured it on 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 their smartphone, and within 24 hours, it was trending in China. Yeah. The other yeah. side of the globe, and people were canceling canceling flights on United Airlines because of it. And uh, the CEO Oscar Munoz of uh, United Airlines made a critical mistake. He was at the time worried about his employees who were, uh, you know, who were unhappy, and there was a union push going on. And so he put out a statement aimed at his employees that said, "I just want you to know that that." No one who worked for United had anything to do with taking Dr. David Dow off the plane. Well, that was comforting to the employees, but to the rest of the world, that just seemed very hard hearted. It doesn't really matter who did it. It's that it happened. Yeah. Uh, uh, and so he got further pummeled for that. So <clears throat> that's just indicative of how difficult it is. And, and I think what it means, Disney in Florida is another great example, right? Actually, can we take a, take a minute on that? Yeah, yeah, of because course, I, please. Right. So what happened in Florida? Uh, Bob Chappick, the CEO of Disney, when Florida passed this law restricting conversations in schools about sexual identity below a certain grade, um, Bob Chappick said what every CEO would have said 10 years ago, I'm not going to get involved. Yeah. It's controversial. I have a big you know, amusement park in Florida. I don't want to have anything to do with it. I'm going to keep my mouth shut. For two weeks, he didn't say anything. And by the end of those two weeks, he had a full-fledged resort uh, revolt on his hands of some of his most valuable employees, the creatives in California who make the man magic. What is Disney? Disney is these amazing films. And the people who provided the amazing part of those films were in full re re revolt. And he met with them and discovered that they felt very deeply about that middle school, elementary school experience when sexual identity is first emerging and just felt like he had to speak. And so two weeks late, he comes out and says something and then the state of Florida goes after him. So he kind of got the worst of both yeah. worlds. Um, uh, his conclusion was, I had to speak out, but I think the failure was not having built those relationships with those employees earlier. So the, the complicated part is understanding as a CEO, your job is not just to come up with a strategy and manage the bottom line. Your job is to understand all the stakeholders in your business who have a significant say yeah. in, in what you do and be in touch with them and understand what their concerns are so that you don't get caught off guard when a crisis happens. Yeah. So it sounds like relationships help mitigate risk. Um, and, and, you know, there, it seems yeah. like there's different types of CEOs There are CEOs who they don't really have relationships with employees, but every now and then they'll do a video, they'll do an all hands and you're like, oh, great. That's the CEO who I've never seen. Or there are other leaders out there who have more of that relationship with their teams. And, you know, you see them, you know, maybe walking down the hall, you talk to them, you get to know them. And then when they make a statement, it's kind of like, well, I, I know that person. Uh, like I, I know their intentions. Oh. I know what they care about. I know their values. And so there's less of that, you know, we're going to come after you and more of that. Well, we're going to give this person a break because we know this person is a human totally. being. And it's what you and I were talking about just a minute ago. The classic CEO of the 20th century yeah. was an engineer. They built systems. They put things together, but, uh, but didn't necessarily have the strongest <coughs> human skills yeah. no, to do the job today. 
you need those human skills because that's what it's all about. Yeah. And I suppose that's a challenge for a lot of leaders because it's not, you know, the assumption is the ivory tower. You kind of sit away from everybody and, uh, you know, you get to kind of do whatever you need to do. Um, but for, I mean, for you as a CEO, how many employees do you guys have actually? Oh, well, we're, we're relatively small. We have around 200 employees. And so how do you deal with some of these things, right? Because I'm assuming even your employees, they want to know like what you think about social or different social causes or injustices and, you know, your feedback, your stance on stuff. But I'm sure you sometimes probably also feel maybe a little bit uncomfortable to talk about something or unsure what to say. How do you navigate that? Well, first of all, I would begin to say that I'm an exemplar <laughs> or that I'm perfect at it. I mean, this is hard stuff and I'm learning along with everyone else. Um, but, but I did come into the job with skills in communication. One of the things that I decided to do early on, even though I was running the company, was to continue to write 300 words a day as part of a daily newsletter called the CEO Daily, yep. which... Uh, you know, gives me an opportunity to communicate with our audience, but it also gives me an opportunity to communicate with my employees. So they get to see what's on my mind and what I'm doing and what I'm thinking on a regular basis. I do open town halls, you know, invite everyone to ask questions. We have even experimented with using a tool called pigeonhole. So hmm. if people don't want to be identified when they ask questions, they can still ask the question try to be very, very uh, uh, transparent with people. I do regular meetings with new employees. I think it's just a lot of meeting, communicating. I mean, one of the things I've, I've started doing is when we have lunch on Wednesday, I just uh, go to the to the uh, the common room where everybody's eating lunch and try and eat with a different group of people every day just so I'm um, uh, uh, closer in touch. I mean, it sounds almost political, and I hate to use the word political because politics has become so um, devalued and, yeah. and ineffective. But but there are a set of political skills and communication skills that you have to develop today to be an effective leader. What's wrong with the business approach of shareholders first? We need to make money first. Why does that approach not make sense for businesses anymore? Well... It doesn't make sense if you do it in the short term. I mean, look, uh, if it in the short term, if you're if you're, I mean, I was uh, in the C-suite of Time Inc. during the final days of that company, so I I saw and there was a there was an activist in the stock. There was a big focus on what are our results going to be this quarter. Yep. If you're focused on the results you're going to report to the market in this quarter. There is no end of bad things you can do to improve those results, right? You can uh, you can cut you can crimp on training programs. You can uh, cut on product improvements, safety programs. You name it. I mean, there are endless things you can do in the short term that will boost your profits in the short term and hurt consumers, employees, communities, the environment, whatever. Um, but but. Where that all goes away is if you think about longer term, you know, you won't have a successful company if the planet is on fire. You yeah. won't have a successful company if society is in civil war. All of these things, if, if, as long as you're thinking about the long term, all of these social effects, will. you won't have a workforce if we don't figure out how to improve the escalator of mobility. So. Uh, all these things that help society in the long term are also going to help your business business in the long term. And so I think at the end of the day, an awful lot of it comes down to time frame. Hmm. It was interesting to me, just last point, that I, I wrote one of the first stories on the business roundtable's decision to change its purpose of a corporation from the shareholder first approach that you just articulated to a stakeholder approach. And I was given four people to talk to about that decision uh, Mary Barra of General Motors, Ginny Rometty, the CEO of IBM, uh, Alex Gorsky, the CEO of Johnson & Johnson, and Jamie Dimon, the CEO of J.P. Morgan. And they didn't say this, but what I realized was those four companies have all been around for more than 100 years. Hmm. So they are the exceptions, but they're exceptions that are focused on the long term. So I, I think if you just 
say, I want to create something here that lasts for 100 years or 200 years or 1,000 years, oh. that you're going to deal with these social issues in a different way that, than you would if your concern is, how do I get the maximum amount of cash on the table to please my shareholders at the end of the quarter? Hmm. Yeah, it's a good way to think about that. Um, Usually the last 15 minutes of the show, I like to focus on specific action items that uh, people can apply in their lives or companies. Uh, before we get into that, kind of two fun questions for you. One is, what's the worst interview you ever had? Uh, have, you ever, <laughs> have you ever bombed an interview or was there one that was really awkward and just didn't go well? And do you have a, a, a story <laughs> oh or anything my God, to share? Uh, there are there are so so many, but I, I I'm going to mention one that's maybe an example of the best and the worst, um, and it and it's on uh, it's on YouTube. If anyone wants to go see it, it was it was quite a number of years ago. I think it was seven years ago. Larry Page oh. of Alphabet, who hasn't done a lot of interviews, so it was a rare opportunity. I interviewed him in front of a hundred CEOs at the Fortune Global Forum in San Francisco. And, you know, the thing about interviewing CEOs is they tend to be, have a lot of media training. So they tend to be very disciplined and it's hard as an interviewer to get them to actually answer your question. And what was so both refreshing and mind blowing about Larry Page was he didn't seem to have had any media training and actually thought about every question and answered it sincerely. So I said, he had just created Alphabet right, uh, uh, from, you know, the holding company, the broader holding company for Google. And some people at the time were saying Alphabet was modeled after Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway. It was a portfolio of companies. So I said to them, and again, we're talking to an audience of CEOs. I said, uh, when you created Alphabet, was there another company that you admired that you had in mind as a model? Hmm. And he goes, uh, well, no. <laughs> so, oh, okay. I said, well, is there another company out there that you do admire uh, when, when you're thinking about how to run your company? He goes, well, uh, no. <laughs> they said, you know, people don't like companies very much. <laughs> oh, so it was, it, was a, it was an amazing moment. He was being 100% sincere. It's not what I was accustomed to from CEOs. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, and last uh, kind of fun question for you. From all the CEOs that you've interviewed, who have you been inspired by the most or learned from the most or who had the greatest impression on you uh, from everybody that you've had the chance to speak with over the past few decades? Oh, geez, there's so many. I I, I hate to mention one. I'll mention a couple. Um, uh, I had a conversation like a couple of years ago with John Donahoe, who is now the CEO of Nike. Mm -hmm. At the time, he had been CEO of Bain, and then he became CEO of eBay. And then he took a year off and like wandered the world. He went to a Buddhist monastery for a while, and he basically, wow. he was sort of in his mid-50s. He said, what am I going to do for the rest of my life? Uh, and then when he returned, uh, he, uh, he came by my office, and we had this conversation, and he talked about how he had decided that being a CEO was what he was meant to do but that he was only going to do it for companies that were having a positive, that he was convinced were having a positive impact on society. Uh, it was a very inspiring conversation. I got him to walk through his whole process, what he did during his year sabbatical, how he got there. Wow. It was very moving. And it was the one conversation where I said, this isn't just about changes in society. This is a different generation of leaders yeah. that we're dealing with. Uh, uh, another uh, a favorite is uh, Ajay Banga, who was the CEO of MasterCard. Yeah, I had him in my last book as well. Well, yeah, so you know, uh, I was just fascinating to talk to him and his background in India and how he thinks about yeah. uh, about these issues. There are many others. Dan Shulman at PayPal. Uh, I was a fan of uh, Inder Nooyi at uh, uh, Pepsi. Um, uh, uh, there, there are generational changes going on that, yeah. that are impressive. 
Thanks again for tuning in to my episode with Alan. Remember that if you subscribe to the show, you're going to get access to a bonus episode where Alan is going to offer some of his personalized coaching and leadership advice for current and aspiring leaders. And he's also going to share how leaders need to be thinking about and adapting to change. It's only available for subscribers, but the best part is the subscription is only $4.99 a month or $49.99 for the entire year, making it less than the cost of a cup of coffee a month and the bonus episode alone is gonna be worth the cost of that subscription think about it you can have a cup of coffee or learn from some of the world's top ceos and business leaders if you subscribe not only are you going to get an episode every single week from one of my amazing guests you're also going to get ad free listening early access to new episodes and so much useful and valuable content i hope you decide to subscribe and support the show